Hello, welcome back to Miner Network. I'm with George Miller again, the Senior Price Analyst over at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Today, we're looking at graphite. George, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for having me. No problem. Obviously, it's been it's been about nine months since we've we've caught up on the topic. Maybe you could, just to begin with, give us a run through. What have we missed in 2022? What have been the highlights? Sure, sure. Um, so, so, yeah, to kind of kick things off, it was a very interesting start to the year. Um, during kind of the first quarter in 2022, as mines in Heilongjiang, China, typically come back into production after the kind of cold winter season where they can't operate in their open pit mines, uh, the Chinese government kind of carried out a, a series of environmental inspections on graphite producers in Lua Bay County. And, and this really uncovered kind of a number of environmental and, and permitting transgressions by the producers there. And, and this really led to some fines being handed out in the region and, and also really kind of temporarily shut down operations beyond typical seasonal closures uh, to kind of amend local mining and refining processes to, to kind of meet these regulations. So it kind of set back the start of supply to the year. And then I think... Um, Throughout the year, on, on the demand side of things, you know, taking note of that uh, slightly limited supply to begin with, there's been a, a bit of a kind of cloudy macroeconomic outlook on the kind of industrial side of the industry, which has guided uh, this graphite consumption from traditional industrial applications, um, you know, lots of steel closures and, and reduced demand for refactory and foundry products kind of led to a, a bit of a polarization um, in the downstream demand trajectories for, for the two largest end markets for, for natural graphite, which are batteries and then these traditional industrial applications, which saw industrial graphite demand really kind of trend downwards throughout the year in comparison to battery anode demand, which has been really, really strong. Um, of course, things to note as well has been the Russia-Ukraine conflict um, that kind of restricted around, I would say, 30,000 tonnes uh, of graphite supply this year, uh, especially local supply in the graphite market, European graphite market. Not too impactful in, in a 1.2 million tonne market globally, but within the region has definitely had an impact on, on supply. So those are kind of the main things to note on the supply and demand side. Okay, perfect. Um, just looking at the price environment at the moment, where where are we sitting in regards to different mesh sizes? Sure. Um, for minus 100 mesh, 94 and 95% carbon purity, uh, which is kind of the favoured grade for anode production for lithium ion batteries, that's at around $815 per tonne at the moment, um, which has actually risen by 25% year to date, uh, which I think is really strong and it's been a kind of steady movement upwards throughout the year. Um, for plus 100 mesh of the same purity, we're closer to $900 per tonne at the moment. And then for plus 80 and plus 50 mesh, so the larger size flake, um, again, of the same purity, we're at $1,150 per tonne and $1,350 per tonne, respectively, for those grades. I just want to take a step back here and look at the EV market, because obviously this is where most of the excitement's coming from with the anode material. Um, we, there have been reports recently that are suggesting that EV sales are slowing. Um, maybe you could just give us a bit of an overview of what the current size of the EV market is and really what this trajectory is trying, trying to look like until 2025 in particular. Yeah, um, so, so this this is kind of true for the near term that we see EV sales slowing. Um, there's typically a slowness in automotive markets um, or automotive markets in, in Q1 of each year, um, which is kind of to be compounded in the EV market specifically by the removal of some Chinese government EV subsidies. But really, we're still anticipating you know, very strong growth um, in the EV market in the midterm, so beyond Q1 next year. And um, you know, this year for kind of BEVs specifically, so not including hybrids, we look to be reaching around 700 uh, sorry, 7 million sales. Um, for 2023, this should be closer to kind of 10 to 11 million sales. And then out to 2025, 16, 17 million sales is, is kind of the forecast at the moment, which is, is really pretty incredible growth over that short time frame. Okay, well, obviously, we're, we're meant to be seeing around 300 gigafactories open their doors. Um, it's, that's been the estimate for a while. When, have any of these actually opened their doors yet? And, and when are we actually expecting these to come online around the world? 
Yeah. So we've got we've got about 360 uh, gigafactories in the pipeline at the moment, which is is pretty incredible. Um, I think around 2025, we expect the number of these to be open at around 290 gigafactories. Um, so so really, there's been good investment into that downstream end of the industry. We see a lot of capacity build out there and. The automakers are certainly partnering with those cell manufacturers. Um, I think more focus is needed on the midstream and the upstream of the industry in order to kind of supply and su sustain the appetite of these gig factories. Okay, um, just just touching on that as well. What, what's jurisdictionally where are we looking in terms of these new gig factories? Is this predominantly China, or is this <laughs> is this a fairly global phenomenon? Uh, fairly global. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing more investment closer to uh, kind of Western automotive end markets. I'd say that's a shift and a trend we've seen of late. Um, you know, China was certainly the first mover when it came to the development of these gigafactories on a, on a large scale. Uh, but now we're seeing them spread really around the world uh, entirely globally, which is great. Love it. And how many, obviously, we're talking about potentially a lot of these gigafactories coming online, they're going to need feedstock of anode material how many mines are we really looking realistically to come into production by 2025 to to feed these 290 new gigafactories by kind of 2025 I think up to kind of 25 new mines should be operating. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, the mining industry is, is notoriously, you know, risky when it comes to uh, development timelines, which are often delayed. Um, we do incorporate some analysis of this. That you know the likelihood of these projects to come to market in, in our forecasting, and I you know encourage your viewers to, to reach out to us for that. Um, but kind of upfront and, and not considering that 20, 25, 26 mines by twenty twenty five should be new in the graphite market. So of the twenty five new mines that are coming online, how many tons per annum, or how, how much actual production of anode grade material do you expect to be coming out of this versus the demand that we're going to be seeing from these gigafactories? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, so just focusing on minus laundry mesh, so that the kind of finer material favoured by anode manufacturers is feedstock. Those mines should contribute around 350,000 tonnes of new supply. Um, I'd say in contrast, we expect the demand for those fines to grow by around 800,000 tonnes in the same timeline. So there's really kind of more fine material needed to be brought to market, or we could see larger mesh size flake milled down to meet the requirements of these anode manufacturers. I think I'll, you know, I'll add that, you know, to meet demand for anode materials in the longer term, um, we do see an estimated 97 natural flake graphite mines will need to be built by 2035, uh, assuming an average size of 56,000 tons a year. So that's a, a really big challenge for the industry. Right. Okay, obviously, so th there's quite a disequilibrium of demand and supply there leading into 2025. What, what sort of prices do you think the small and fine plate graphite should should really be achieving by then yeah so with a it's a, it's a growing uh, market deficit um in the flake graphite market so you know why well, can't give maybe exact price forecast what i can say is definitely higher than today um and let's say over a thousand dollars per ton would be kind of expected for that for fine material um by kind of 2025 and would that be for the sort of 95 percent total graphite content material or is this for the spherical graphite Correct, that'll be for minus 100 mesh, 94, 95% carbon purity flake graphite. Obviously, many mining companies and industry reports do usually quote benchmark and their supply and demand graphs. When, when we are looking at those graphs that you publish, are they are they for the 95% total graphite continent or is that also or is that for the spherical graphite? Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, m most of these supply demand charts are for flake graphite concentrate. And I think, you know, the reason you won't frequently see any supply demand balances for, uh, you know, spherical graphite, USPG, showing large deficits in the longer term is that ultimately, you know, I don't really perceive spherical graphite production as, as a longer term bottleneck in that anode value chain. Um, within China, it takes kind of, you know, six to 18 months to reach production for those facilities compared to, you know, five to 15 years for a, a development of a flake graphite mine. So we, we definitely think that capacity can kind of be built out on a, on a piecemeal basis as and when demand requires and um, that said however you know on a regional basis i definitely do think there's there's not enough um spherical graphite capacity being built out outside of china um closer to end markets in europe and north america so yeah i definitely think that's an opportunity the industry can really capitalize on what's the view at the moment in terms of the shift from china owning the majority of the world supply for graphite now 
versus what this could look like in 2025 and maybe even 2030? Yeah, so by 2025, we see China capturing uh, a much smaller market share because we definitely see strong development of new flake graphite supply on the African continent as a new kind of flake graphite supply hub. Um, so by 2025, we see China capturing ar around 40, 45% uh, of the world's flake graphite supply and then out until 2030, something closer to 30%, I think, would, would be accurate on that timeline. Okay. In terms of the anode chemistry uh, we're seeing at the moment, obviously there's there's it's not just natural graphite that can go into a battery. Perhaps you can just give us a bit of a breakdown of what the, what's currently being used. Obviously, there's synthetic, there's silicon, there's other metals or minerals that can go in this. What does it look like in terms of breakdown of supply at the moment versus what you think or forecasting um, moving forward? Yeah, so t today, the, the majority of the market is actually captured by synthetic graphite anode production. Uh, and this is really a factor of China being a dominant force in the market today. Um, that's a chemistry they prefer to manufacture. Um, for a lot of the smaller anode manufacturers, the, the feedstock for synthetic graphite, which is um, a pre-calcined green coke, uh, which is kind of a residue of oil refining, is, is much more available to them than natural flake graphite. Uh, looking forward, however, we definitely see some um, environmental and cost benefits to using natural graphite feedstock for anode material, um, namely lower cost and more environmentally friendly to process. Um, but there are also some performance benefits there. And um, that Kind of means we see some blending today, but looking forward, we definitely anticipate uh, natural graphite to hold um, a, a minor majority in terms of market share in the anode market over synthetic, um, with then increasing proportions um, as a niche of the market for silicon and other anode types to um, potentially lithium metal as a kind of next trend technology. Brilliant. Okay. And just as, as a final thought, obviously, you had the benchmark conference in LA not too long ago um, that had quite a reaction in the graphite market in particular. A lot of noise coming out of there saying graphite could even be poised to do a lithium. And obviously I'm assuming by that, it means sort of that hockey stick upwards. Um, is that is that correct? Are we, are we about to see that or do you, do you think that's possible? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, with regard to pricing, you know, lithium, I would say went up by a kind of 400, 500% over the past couple of years. I, I think probably not. Um, you know, graphite is is typically quite a low cost commodity, and we just see pricing is much more stable in that industry, um, less guided by by sentiment. But I think you know, with regard to the volume of demand for, for graphite, I, I would say absolutely, or, or potentially even more in terms of volume. Um, you know, given that graphite is the largest contribution in terms of mass of any critical mineral uh, in an EV battery pack, with kind of fifty to one hundred kilos um, of flake graphite needed to manufacture each each vehicle pack. Um, you know, by 2030, we anticipate the market size to, to more than double flake graphite um, with very similar growth rates in terms of lithium on that front. Um, and this is even from a larger market today at around 1.2 million tons in size at the moment. So um, in some senses, yes, I definitely think on the volume front. Good. George, thank you for your time. No problem. Thanks, Peter.